Welcome back everybody to your second daily update on the state of the Malazan Empire. Um, this is part two of the God is not willing. I just finished it and um, I found one final beer in our fridge and I hope it won't start raining again because that sucks. <laughs> so let's have us a talk on part two of the God is not willing. Cheers. So, part two was shorter than part one and rather action-y. Lots of action going on there this time round and um, yeah, not so much like with like new uh, like themes and stuff like that. Well, not too much of it, I guess. So let's try and talk about things. We see like the, the, the ongoing plan of bulk that noble that like i don't know cas devore for amateurs kind of guy <laughs> um and like every i mean in fact part of that is already like was already you know started in part one and i didn't talk about it earlier on because you know mine like a sieve um but what i find interesting here is that the lack of awareness in a way or like the way he describes it like so we had that point it was actually earlier on when he talks to ara is that her name like his lover slash maybe betrothed formerly betrothed and, and whatnot and he talks about the whole fact that like he's like obviously a nobleman and everything and him then going into the forests and meeting like former like nathy that have had fled so we come once again to one of the other theme that we see a lot with the Steven Erickson, and that is how systems, especially what you might call a capitalist system in this case, um, or one that is very much built on transactions, firm rules, um, and so forth that we see in Midnight Tides, for example, how those systems trap people in there how, how those are systems and it's something that we also see in forge of darkness at least and probably also in Fall of light how like such like rigid societies rigid rigid like social systems economic systems how they trap people in in their roles how they like the whole idea of rising within that kind of society is basically an illusion used to keep people in their place which makes just leaving that society and going out into a place beyond um monetary financial systems and what you want not where you you know barter and that's about it so liberating to some people and we see that with someone like bulk who is at his heart his heart or was at least a privileged person right he's he's for he's obviously nobility he was rich and so forth <laughs> and um for someone like this to um first like resent his privileges take being taken away by the malazans um and through that resentment starting to question the actual entire system is like very interesting to me I do like that a lot because it kind of shows that he's not only there to like, you know, re like revenge on the Malazans for personal reasons and like past slights and whatnot. And, but also since we all at this point kind of know that he's in league with uh, some of the forest people, he has sort of taken on some larger cause, I think. I mean, we're obviously not yet there, but you know, We'll see where all of that is going rather soon, I suspect. So there's that. Another thing that I hadn't talked about before is Oum's um, ghost that we see in the first scene of the of the book, like after, like the first scene of book one. Now it's apparently helping him for some reason. We don't know why. It's questionable what what it does. It seems alien in a way. But then again, people getting into, you know, contact with things that are beyond their understanding is something that happens a lot in Malazan, in the Malazan world. 
Um, so there's that, and it'll be interesting what happens. It apparently has the ability to physically attack people in the physical world, so it's more than just a ghost or spirit, I presume, because ripping them off heads is, you know, something that most ghosts can't do. <laughs> so we'll see where that is going. Um, I don't know, like, we, we, we see more of, like, how Silver Lake is still the sordid kind of place it was in, in House of Chains, with even, like, the mayor being Silgar Younger, who seems, who's probably Silgar's son, so there's that, um, and, um, I guess that's, like, an interesting thing that we can watch there, at least in some bits with Captain Gruff, who is, like, fucking awesome, um, but the thing that we can see there is um, how, like, empire and colonization or colonialism, you know, break down because you have, like, the Nathi people there. It's the edge of the empire, the, the reach or, like, empire discipline, bureaucracy have more or less broken down because it's, you know, very few people and so forth. Um, People, like the Malazan people out there are kind of getting corrupted by, like, things and, you know, traditions and people on the, the like, the local people, I guess. And this is an int uh, important aspect there because one of the things that we learned early on what the Malazan Empire does, what makes it such an, like, successful colonizer in a way, or such a successful empire, is exactly that it, you know clamps down on local corruption, it, um, you know, breaks apart, like, so local strongmen and stuff like that, to um, ideally um, raise the general wealth of everyone, so the lower classes um, have, like, no reason to hate the Malazans. In fact, quite the opposite. They kind of like the Malazans because they fare better under their rule than they did under local, like, feudalist big rules and whatnot. Now we see how that doesn't always work out if there's not enough like incorruptible malazans on the ground to um, enforce those rules. And that's sort of what we could see already back in the day with uh, in House of Chains and we can see it even more now in uh, The God Is Not Willing. The other aspect there is that um, with a place like Silver Lake being like where the local wealth, the entire economy was, and we remember that from House of Chains, right? The entire economy was built on enslaving the tablor, the tablikai, or enslaving um, indigenous people. And the Malazan Empire, being very much not in favor of slavery, could not just, you know, take out the local, like, hierarchy and then take over, <clears throat> just thus raising, like, general wealth at, the, at that place. But because of its, you know, moral or general rules, laws, it had to destroy the entire economy, thus making a town like Silver Lake very much, you know, obsolete. Well, do they have, apart from that, yeah, they can go fishing. It can just be, like, a local fishing and farming village with, like, a few hunters out there, and that's about it. So, uh, unlike with other places in the Malazan Empire that the Malazan Empire conquered, um, I don't know, think Pale or what have you, um, here, the Malazan method didn't really work because it had to destroy the entire society, not just take out, you know, the people in power and the corrupt people. Because, like, yeah, that kind of economy had to die completely. So everyone dependent on slavery and the slave trade, whether it's, you know, people like Damask at the time, who then becomes a hunter, whether it's, um, you know, the slavers, whether it's, like, people that work for them and so forth, like, all of them, you know, lost through Malazan occupation. And that makes that makes um, holding on to that power much more difficult because it, you know, 
creates a lot of resentment against the Malazans there. Which, once again, is just like one of the reasons why, you know, conquest and occupation are kind of, can be kind of difficult, right? It also shows how Silver Lake has never fully recovered because there's nothing for them there, right? The, it was the kind of like almost in a way, I guess you can compare it to some of those like boom towns in 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 the U.S. or wherever, like in America, is when you discover a resource. And it sucks to call like slavery a resource, but the way it was like done there is exactly that. So you dehumanize the people that you enslave and you trade them as items. I mean, they're like a natural resource. That's sort of like the kind of places where people discover oil or gold or something. Everyone goes there. The whole thing booms and blows up. And then once the resource is tapped out, the whole thing crumbles again. Like if the circus moves on, so to speak. And that's something that you can see there in a way, because like, even though like, like yes, the, the the that like highly priced resource that was Teblor slaves has like been taken away. First slavery has been like you know forbidden. Then you have the um, all like liberation and uprising of the remaining slaves and all of that. And yeah, so now Silver Lake is already kind of dying, or at least shrinking down to a more natural size and we can see that you know like the people that remain are kind of you know the desperate ones that have no other way you know they have like no way to leave the place sort of so yeah that's something that i found interesting about silver lake when you compare it to um what we see through carcer's eyes in in house of chains Um, uh, what else do we need to talk about? We need to talk about, and I said that earlier today, it's like, you know, the first ones are Knuckles and Star Wheel. Um, so we come to the reality of those new warrants that were created by Icarium in Dust of Dreams. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see all of those, to see a new... And this is something I found very fascinating once we come to Monkret. So cool, Monkret is back. Um, the thing is that like the new method of divination is no longer the whole. Is no longer um, the houses of the, you know, the houses of the cards of the deck of dragon, but it's the runts, which I find very fascinating. I I suspect it is connected to the fact that, you know, the first people wandering those new worms were, um, obviously, um, sin and grub whom everyone called the runts at the time. Or maybe it's a different reason, but I, I figure that might just be it. But it's also, it's coins. And it's a lot more of them. Which, once again, I is like an interesting aspect when you look at magic in the Malazan world. You start out with like basically one kind of magic, I guess, when you look at Forge of Darkness. You start out with like one kind of magic, that being whatever the Azath and I do. And then you build it out into holds. You have the hold of darkness and so forth. And then it diversifies even more into the warrens of uh, the deck of dragons. And then you get even more warrens when, like, the next system that overlays all of that, which is Icarium's warrens that we're talking now with, about, with, for example, stuff like Blue Iron, which obviously is electricity, kind of connected to the Kachanja model. Obviously, we need to talk about them in a second as well. Um, so there's that, which kind of goes along with the general idea of, like, how sciences, uh, how science and academia also evolves and diversifies further and further and takes these things apart even more. It's also obviously clear that like more and more people are actual mages in the Marines or in the army. So th there's that. Magic seems to become more prevalent in like not only the Malazan military strategy, but in general, they, they there seems, seems to be more like small-time talents around that can do at least some magic, which is pretty cool, I guess. Uh, 
Right, what else? Um, yes. Let's switch a bit to the whole Rand and Damask um, stuff for a while there, before we come back to Monkrad and that thing. Because I'm confused and all that. So, obviously, they both got split up. We knew that. And um, then you had um, um, Rand carrying on first, like, one of the Jack and then, like, a second Jack later on. Once again, what I really enjoyed about that is how the Jack... And I guess I can appreciate it more now that I've seen at least the Jellican, even though I've not yet seen the Jack in Forge of Darkness. But the point is, like how you have something that is like a weird combination of a human and animalistic society with the rules in there being like even starker and like maybe it's also a bit more honest in a way it's like you have that weird idea of like dominance and fight to the death and challenge and so forth which seems to be more like us humans try to imagine wolves or like they, i mean the jack are wolves so they try to imagine like how wolf society works which is you know obviously wrong but still we we have these animalistic traits like emphasized very much in the jack and we see that with like that second one nilgan whatever his name is i want to call him nailgun but i <laughs> that's not his name the second Jack that shows up and wants to kill the old Jack and then <laughs> Rand just knocks them both out, out and carries both of them, which is pretty fucking cool. Um, but what I really find fascinating about Rand is like how he's... And this, I feel, is important to look at. Once again, we come to that whole idea of... Um, like growing up and childhood and development of character in a way like Rand has had like very little about that and even though he has now got like the spirit in his knife and has finally come to realize <clears throat> that he didn't have friends and those people were afraid or hurt hurting him and harming him Rand is still so far away from any ideas of rules of society and rules of behavior but it, so his innate like character is very much what is ruling him. It's like he doesn't want to kill, he doesn't want to hurt people, he doesn't want to harm anyone. He, um, which is pretty fascinating when you look at debates like, you know, state of nature being something like everyone, like <laughs> humans at heart knowing that violence is a bad thing and so forth. But still, when you look on the other side at the Jack, who seem to be also very close to, like, a natural state in a way, for them, obviously, violence is always their first resort, because that's how they determine sta status in their, like, what you might call society, <clears throat> which could lead you to think that actually society, any kind of society, is something that is based on violence. You know, there's been discussions about that in Forge of Darkness as well, and Rand being so far outside of society through his childhood and so forth is someone who just does not resort to violence unless he has to or is threatened in a way. He's a very defensive person, I guess, in, in that way. Um, so yeah, that's just something that I find interesting to look at how Rand... I mean, there's something to be said about Rand in the future, I guess, about like how like the whole idea of innocence and if that's a blessing or a curse or anything like that how it influences people if it's a if it is okay to do or like morally right or correct to um take like innocence away to you know give people some kind of awareness of like realities of society or if you know if innocence is bliss that's something that we need to talk about with Rant, I guess. And um, I'm... Yeah, I'm looking forward to see where all of that is going. Now let's look at what happens to... To Damask, right? So Damask walks... Th 
through that hold, the beast hold entry, um, entrance that he has um, in the cave of whoever War Bitch is, and I still assume War Bitch is Vandere. Which would probably explain that it was apparently Tog who came through um, at the end of the Crippled Guard and got killed, but you know, <clears throat> maybe I'm just an idiot. Um, but anyway, he lands in this other world and he finds Sky Keeps, Kachain Sky Keeps, and that's like very interesting for me. Because I thought it was only Kachain Naruk that are using Sky Keeps, but then he says that they have splayed tails. And I'm not sure, maybe that's just like me not understanding language. But I was always trying to figure out are those like Naruk or those Jamal, because he calls them Kachain Jamal. I'm not, I'm not sure of how, how much people like Damask actually know about the differences between short and long tails. But anyway, what we find there is, once again, them just, like, taking away, like, everything. And that, like, harvesting, hunting, everything. Which, you know, is pretty fucking monstrous. But then again, it's not exactly what we as humans do when we go, like and send our huge fishing fleets and just empty parts of the ocean or just kill entire buffalo herds or whatever. It's sort of the same thing, but having it done by these Kachain kind of gives it, like, shows it clearer, I guess. <laughs> then also we come to that god that um, is chained there by its believers, which once again will be something that we need to look at in the um, uh, in the future of this book, I guess. Once again, that connection between um, gods and their believers, and that, like, their belief can chain or, like, um, enforce specific rules for gods, in a way. And he's chained there, and he can't get out of it, even though all of his believers are apparently dead. But another mortal, a possible believer, like Damask, can just go and can uh, actually break those chains easily and then the god can do what he or she or they were meant to do which is defend their world because that's sort of one of those things that a lot of deities are it's like they are some kind of protector that's sort of the idea there so they go on and just kill the entire like tear down the entire sky keeps which you know <laughs> Those were living beings as well. Was like, is there justice in killing all of those? Um, hard to say. Anyway, so um, Damask comes back, and we have that epic scene when he just sees um, Rand walking towards him with like two <laughs> Jack on his back, which on the other end, like, holy shit, how tough is Rand actually? And he's only a half blood um, Tablakai. So there's, there's that. Um, now let's go back to Monkrite for a second and look at that. And then I guess we're sort of done here for tonight. All right. Monkrite shows back up. We talk about the ascension of bridge burners. And it seems that with like these new warrants, and when you connect the idea that like... <coughs> Technically, ascendants basically rule or are connected, very often connected, especially when they try to become gods, connected to specific realms, to specific warrants. That obviously means that having that new set of warrants that Ikarium they kind of created in some way, I guess, means there's suddenly a lot, a lot of room for new ascendants to take over some of those places, right? And that, I feel, is something that we'll um, also see more of. Monkrat, one of them, very consciously trying to take over whatever kind of warren that will be. I don't know. He's now the Monk of Rats, which, you know, pretty cool. And um, I guess we'll have to think more about like how he changed as a character, that whole idea that you cannot fully leave the bridge burners even though he deserted at the time he was still obviously like linked to the bridge burners linked enough to the bridge burners to actually get the blessing 
Also, it's interesting to see how much people know about this kind of stuff now, right? I mean, Spindle, of course, he's, you know, he's been a mage forever. He's been a bridge burner forever. But even, like, someone like Captain Gruff and others, they're like, everyone knows so much about magic, about warrants and stuff, compared to when we started, like, out with, like, the, um, um, the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Like, I don't know, in Gardens of the Moon, no one understood that magic stuff, not... <laughs> <laughs> not the reader, nor like any of the most like nor like most of the characters, <laughs> except obviously um, Quick Ben. But you know, never trust Quick Ben. Um, so there's that. Now let's have a like a final look, I guess, um, at the Marines. Now obviously the entire Legion seems to be uh, seems to be Marines, and they're all doing like that banter thing, like. And I've said it before, like earlier today, they are like really good at the banter, right? And Ericsson is really good at describing that banter, but I've come to that point where I'm like, how much of that is just for show? Especially when you have that whole like, um, heavies trying to do a headcount kind of thing and scaring everyone. And I don't know, it's just like, it, it almost feels like too much of it. Because it feels like, I don't know, it feels like a show. It feels like insincere in a way. And I'm not sure if I like that or not. We'll see how, where it goes. I guess the other thing is that so far we haven't seen the Marines do that much. There's not like any huge fights or anything yet. So I guess that's like the other thing. Because what <laughs> balanced it all out with the Malazan Book of the Fauna was like you... You see all these, like, marines doing all their crazy shit. You see some like, hellion falling drunk from one place to the other. But then you also had all these, like, gigantic battles. And you see, like, holy shit, they, they, they may do a lot of banter and absurd stuff. But when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, they just go out and kill everyone. That's pretty fucking badass. So maybe that sort of imbalance here is what makes me kind of, I don't know. Not always happy with how the banter thing is continuing and like how it's basically everyone trying to get everyone else all the time. That's I, I don't know. Feels kind of weird for now. Oh yeah, I'm still enjoying it. I just felt I personally liked part one more than part two. Even though, you know, Blue Iron... Blue Iron Warren doing the whole like lightning thing is pretty cool. That's pretty cool magic. Lightning magic sounds like a lot of fun. So yeah, that's sort of where I am right now. And I'll um, yeah, can't wait to hear like your reactions to what what you think when you read this far, and what kind of questions you have. What kind of questions you totally not have that I have, and then we'll have us a discussion on that, and I'll talk to you tomorrow about part three and possibly even part four. We'll see how that goes. Until then, cheers.